Welcome everyone. Um, we're gonna get started in 30 seconds. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Today we are truly honored to welcome Dr. Jennifer Lucero, MDMA. She is the Associate Dean for Admissions at UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine and the Vice Chair of Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion for the Department of Anesthesiology and Perioperative Medicine at UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine. Her clinical work is in obstetric anesthesia. A graduate of California State University, Northridge, Dr. Lucero received her master's in general experimental psychology with a focus in social psychology, her medical degree from Yale School of Medicine. Her postgraduate training consisted of a double residency in obstetrics and gynecology and in anesthesiology from the University of California, San Francisco, UCSF. She completed fellowship training for obstetric anesthesiology in 2011, followed by National Institutes of Health, NIH, T32 research fellowship training in 2012 at UCSF as well. Prior to coming to UCLA, Dr. Lucero was an associate professor of clinical anesthesia and perioperative care at UCSF, specializing in obstetric anesthesiology and served as the department's inaugural vice chair of diversity, equity, and inclusion at UCLA. She does serve as the associate dean of admissions for the vice David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. She does oversee the medical school admissions, financial aid and scholarship, and pathway and outreach. Dr. Lucero is the co-PI for the Health Resources and Services Administration at the UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine. The Center for Excellence Underrepresented in Medicine grant is what she also oversees. In addition, she serves as a vice chair of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion for the Department of Anesthesia. She holds a dual appointment in obstetrics and gynecology with clinical interests in preeclampsia and adherent placental disease. Dr. Lucero has a decade of experience in medical school admissions and participates actively in the recruitment of underrepresented students to the profession of medicine through her work in pathway and outreach programs. As a Chicana physician, she takes a special interest in diversity issues in medicine and disparities in the delivery of obstetric healthcare to women of color. Of course, I'd like to thank our audience for joining us and now turning it over to Dr. Lucero. It is with honor and welcome and to thank you greatly for your time today, Dr. Lucero. Thank you so much, Giselle. Um, it is great to be here. This is, um, I've already uh, been with you all for a couple times before and I just love um, to come back and, and I wanna thank you for inviting me back. Um, you all are a wonderful group and so dedicated and ask great questions. So I'm gonna um, share my screen here and we'll get started with um, the talk. And I wanna leave time um, for, questions, because that's really the most important um, part of this is the question and answer. So, all right, so you all can see my screen. Yeah, thumbs up. Yes. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, so I'm going to do this overview that really is going to talk about um, what we have at the David Geffen School of Medicine, and then really segue into um, touching on our pathway and outreach, and then also the application. Some of this stuff will be uh, things that you already know, um, but I do wanna be able to, to kind of give you a, a large um, you know, swath of kind of what, what we do and what, and what I um, am involved in at the David Geffen School of Medicine. 
So we'll start with, we, we always talk about, we're going to train the next um, leaders to become outstanding physicians and. And so I wanna touch about um, the various opportunities that we have here. Um, we think about, and we'll talk about how we're doing that with our new curriculum, but you know, we want you to either be um, a scientist, public health, um, expert, an artist, a social activist, an entrepreneur, a writer, all those various things and beyond. So there's opportunities with our new curriculum to do these various things. We always talk about um, at DGSOM the cultural North Star. We have a whole program about the cultural North Star and with the values that guide us. We think about do what's right. And of course, we need to be united in our shared mission for advancing science and medicine. We're working together to eliminate, in, eliminate inequity. We need to be grounded in our ethics and data and we balance our short and long-term effects of our actions. When we wanna make things better, we want our work to have an impact. We have to be constantly curious and we seek out diverse voices and we embrace our failures as opportunities to learn. And when we're kind, we're strongest when we show empathy, we have the courage to be honest, we listen, understand, and we engage in dialogue even when we disagree. So we sort of have these principles that guide us and uh, we continue to do the work um, when we have a whole, um, department that works on the cultural North Star and, you know, change and, and continue to, to have these values. I want to talk about when we said the outstanding physician and um, we, we kind of think about like what, what does that and mean and how do we do that? Well, we just started the new curriculum. Um, we are in the process uh, right now of recruiting our third class that will start this new curriculum. And so I'm giving you a little schematic because it's a little bit different than what you think with medical school. It's still four years of medical school, but we've done things a little bit differently where we start out in our first year with base camp. And of course that culminates with our white coat ceremony. And then we launch into our foundations of practice our scientific foundations of medicine and our early authentic clinical experience. That actually goes for a full year and that's our preclinical work. After we finish that, we start with an intercession and go straight into our clerkships. So you start your clerkships in your MS2 year rather than your MS3 as I did way back when, when I was in med school. We finish the clerkships um, and that's the time that we've set aside for the students to do their um, step exam preps and um, and then take the exam. So we can talk a little bit about this, but you know, when you, um, in order to be a licensed physician, you have to take three step exams. So USMLE step one, step two, and then step three. We do step one and two in medical school and step three is usually at the end of your intern year. And then you apply for your licensing. Oh, I jumped too quickly, okay. So um, you'll take your first two, and this is sort of where we have it in the, in the curriculum. And then I jumped ahead because I wanted to talk about the discovery year. The MS3 year is when you do your discovery year. I have another slide that I'll go back to in a sec that I jumped ahead to. That, um, we'll talk about what the discovery year is. You get a whole year of the discovery year, and that's when you start to develop you know, your and and what you're going to do with your and. At the end of that discovery year, you go into your electives and residency interviews, and then that um, you have match day, which is coming up for us March 17th. That's where our students find out where they're going to do their graduate medical education or their residencies. And then we have our commencement. So let's talk about the discovery year. So the discovery year um, is a year where you can select an area of focus and we kind of have this as the flowers and you know here's the petal of the flower right so global health social science medical humanities innovation entrepreneurship each of those areas have something where you will spend your time working in that area doing research maybe if you're doing global health you'll go uh, to one of our global health sites across the world focus on that, you'll have, um, you know, various types of opportunities depending, or you could do an additional degree, get an MPH, an MPP, an MBA. So that discovery year really allows you to have this opportunity. In addition, the students will do a longitudinal clinical experience. And that's where you continue to build up your clinical skills that you learned in your MS2 year. So that's really um, our uh, important new curriculum. And I think it's really innovative. And a lot of students are very excited about the discovery year. So we talk about, you know, here's some of our um, 
met our med students that were um, going through at Harbor that are now uh, residents. And so we really want to create this environment um, and have uh, your life have an impact, but be with a community of like minded individuals. Um, this is Dr. Braddock. Um, I, I, I can't do a talk about DGSO and medical education without having um, a, a shout out to Dr. Braddock. He is our Vice Dean of Education and has led us through this amazing curriculum development and his innovation in medical education and the work that he's done in creating a, a, and just a really top-notch institution um, in medical education is, is without, I mean, I can't say enough about that. So right now I want to switch gears for a moment um, and talk about pre-health pathway programs. This may be more relevant to you now, depending on where you're at in your um, education. So I run the out, uh, Pathway and Outreach Office. We do a lot of different things, and I'm going to just highlight some of those. We have our pathway programs, which I'll talk about. We just launched our pre-health guidance center, um, which we mentioned at our last session that we had with you all in December. And that's really a way for you to connect um, with a virtual visit with our team and ask about different programs that we have available and really kind of see where you're at and what opportunities you have. There's a lot of programs that we have at DGSOM. I'm really going to highlight the ones that are through our office, but but we're sort of, if you think of us as we're like the hub, and um, if you contact us at the Pre-Health Guidance Center, we give you the spokes of all the different things, depending on what your particular individual interest is or where you're at in your education. And then we have different events um, that we highlight, um, different outreach events, and we go to a lot of different places. Um, we've, we've go to individual community colleges, and we have a many of our um, outreach events that we do at, at the um, Affinity uh, um, Outreach Events. So let me just highlight our pathway programs that are particularly run through our office. Again, this is uh, a small number of what we have available depending on what you wanna do and where you're at. Um, and again, the Re Guidance Resource Center is a place to kind of start if you don't, not sure kind of where you, where you fit in and what you're thinking you wanna do. But let me talk about the, the three programs we run out of our office. So we have the SHPEP program. It's the Summer Health Professions Program. That's run through the Robert Wood um, Johnson's AAMC. It is a six-week program. It's designed for students that are in their first two years of undergraduate. And that is at no cost. And it's an on-site. We do um, an on-site uh, six-week where you stay at the dorms. You connect. You have a community um, of your SHPEP uh, students and your cohort. And then we have the pre-medical enrichment program. That's the prep program. That's actually um, a four-week program that um, this year we have five weeks where that first week is virtual because we do, um, we're going to start with a Princeton Review MCAT prep. That's for students who've decided that they're definitely want to do medical school um, and they're in their last two years of college or just graduated but are not applying to medical school. And then there's the reapplication program, and that's uh, an 11th month program that we do um, for students who have applied and didn't gain admission to medical school. So let me just highlight the SHPEP program. Again, freshmen and sophomores considering health professions. There's three tracks, medicine, dentistry, and nursing. So maybe you haven't decided you're thinking you want to go into medicine, or maybe you want to, you're thinking about dentistry, there's different you know, tracks that you can join. Um, this is basically an academic enrichment program. You're going to get intro into the health professions, learning skills, problem-based learning, financial literacy, wellness, workshops, specific uh, track-specific um, panels, so nursing panel, medicine panel, um, dentistry panel, and then you'll have individual advising. We started a longitudinal mentorship where you're paired with one of the faculty mentors, and then you, that faculty mentor is your mentor until you matriculate into a health professions program. This is the, um, you know, it's developing future leaders that will change the face of medicine, nursing, and dentistry and improve healthcare delivery policy and research in underserved communities. So that's our SHPEP program. Um, we have our UCLA prep program, and that's really focused in medicine. It's a four-week program, although I mentioned there's a, a, a start of a virtual week where you're just doing MCAT prep. You'll continue to do MCAT prep during the rest of the four weeks when you're in person. Um, and these are 
as the highlights MCAT preparation, guide to AMCIS, learning skills, problem-based learning inquiry. It's again, an academic enrichment program. And again, we also have individual advising and longitudinal membership, uh, mentorship. And so this is for recent graduates um, from junior college, recent graduates who are juniors or seniors in a four year or just um, not ready to apply yet to medical school and just graduated from college. So it's um, ideas to really help students from disadvantaged backgrounds um, to really get them um, to have more readiness for medicine and the prep for the, the application. Now the UCLA RAP, it's a post back program. It's for reapplicants. So you've had to apply to not gotten into medical school. We have this individualized reapplication plan, again, more MCAT preparation, kind of looking at your application. We look at it in a different way and we approach what your application, what were the strengths, what were the weaknesses, and really look at where we can help you in that 11 month program. And so this is for California residents only, and it is has a portion of it, which is academic enrichment, but really focused on, you know, what are your strengths, continue to develop those, what are your areas where we need improvement. So here's some dates of the different programs. And of course, we have some alumni um, who are um, in our uh, medical school right now. So we're really excited to highlight. We have a great group. And I'm all, it always uh, gets me very excited when uh, we have our students that were in our pathway programs um, come to our medical school. So this is information about our outreach and pathway office, and you can sort of see and, and log in, use that if you want to take a screenshot of that. Now I'm going to touch on um, briefly the application and preparation to medical school. I'm going to give you sort of some pearls and the things that I think about, but again, you know, I am one person. I'm going to first tell you that um, when you apply to medical school, I'm not going to give you the secret sauce. There isn't. There's a lot of different things to look at, and we can talk about this in the in the Q&A, but each of you have your own why medicine, and each of you have things that bring you bring that are unique, lived experiences. And so the important part is to understand, you know, again, what are your strengths? What are the things that you need to improve on? What are areas that and that you think, you know, you want to pursue more? And again, why medicine for you? So let me just talk about this is the nuts and bolts part of it. So a lot of this has to do with planning ahead. So you want to gather the experience, the academic qualifications, you know, this takes a long time to put that together. Um, again, I always think about it as it's a, it's a spectrum, right? You're, you're on this journey that doesn't end once you start medical school. It continues. And so you have to look at it where you're at now in your journey. And then you're going to continue and think about, okay, what if, what experiences can I gain now? What are experiences that I want to do? And what medical school will help me with that? And what where am I going to go? And when you think about your graduate medical education, you're going to be rethinking about that as well, too. So if you look at it from the perspective of, you know, now is a little bit hard. Let's back back up now would be, or go forward in time and think, okay, I'm getting ready to apply. I have to have everything thought, you know, thought up and ready to go. And then I'm going to apply, let's say it was going to be this year, May, 2023, right? And then you would, that's to enroll for fall 2024. So it's a long process, even just for the application period. So you have to think about, here's some sort of timelines. A lot of times for us, we start interviewing as early as September and we continue through January and offers for us are rolling. So we start offering um, admission October um, and then, you know, we have our wait list. We have, you know, lots of flexibility that happens as people are deciding where they want to go. And we have given, I've given my last, last offer of acceptance off the wait list literally the Friday before they start on Monday. So, you know, the process goes for a long time. So you want to do your homework on where to apply, and that's where the MSAR comes into, into um, it's a very helpful kind of gives you all of the different med medical schools. The thing about this is um, I do like to put one caveat. Um, it's an average. They're showing an average GPA, an average MCAT, and acceptance rates. I think there is a 
time when people get discouraged and think, okay, I see this MCAT score and I don't have that MCAT score. That's not the minimum. We have to think about it's an average. But you do want to think about being thoughtful about, you know, what are my chances? If my MCAT score is not high enough, you know, am I just going to spend all this money applying and, and nothing happens, right? So you want to look at the different schools and, and be, um, and that's where you can sort of look at having um, resources like the, the pathway programs and the, um, the, these are areas where you have that built-in connection. Um, but I do want you to look at when you see the MSAR, again, that's an, that's an average of what the GPA is, what the average MCAT score is. I'll have a diagram that I'll show you in a moment. So um, some schools are schools that have a particular mission for rural medicine. They may have a particular mission for urban underserved, or they may do a lot of different things, or they may be really focused in research. Look at the missions of the programs. That's what the MSAR is going to help you with. If you are someone that's grown up in an urban environment that wants to go back and serve your urban community, probably shouldn't be applying to a rural program. Right. So you have to think about what the application, you know, what the medical school and is that going to fit with what you want to do. So uh, certain programs, certain medical schools have prerequisites. Some don't. You need to make sure that you look at them and the GPA does matter. You want to know that you have a, a the, the question that we ask is, can they handle the fast paced work of medical school? It doesn't mean that we only take people with 4.0s just means that you have to know that you can do the, the work in the sciences. And so even if, so UCLA doesn't have prerequisites for science, but um, we want to know that you can do, you know, the, the science courses and you understand them because you're going to be doing more science courses in your preclinical. And, you know, really the MCAT tests you on that anyway, so you're going to have to take these, these classes. So um, the other part of the application is the letters of reference. Now, the GPA and the MCAT is just one part, okay? It's not the whole thing. And I know everybody gets so um, worked up, worried, you know, and fixated on, I hear so much about MCAT GPA, MCAT GPA. And you know, that is one portion. We all do a holistic review for admissions. And what that means is, we look at the mission of our program and we look at what the students who have applied, what they've done and, and does that fit our mission? How do we get that information? Well, you know, we can get some part, a portion of that information from an MCAT and GP. And that just tells me, you know, are you gonna be able to handle the fast paced curriculum of the science? And are you gonna struggle with taking USMLEs or standardized test scores? That's it, that's all that it tells me when I look at your MCAT. Can you take a standardized test and pass it? Or do you need some extra help? Or is that not one of your strengths, right? But, you know, there is, that's only one portion of the application. One of the areas that I think is really important is the letter of reference. That's a person who ideally is going to know you well, that you've worked with. I know that we think about, oh, I got to get, you know, a letter of recommendation from the organic chemistry teacher. Well, if the organic chemistry teacher had you in a class with 300 people, they're not really going to be able to tell us much about you unless you were their TA, unless they worked with you, unless they did research with you. So think about your letters of, of recommendation that you're asking. You want them to know you, know you well. They can understand how you think, how you uh, work with a group, how you communicate with your colleagues. Are you a team player? You know, these are the things that I want to know that are additional because medicine is a team sport. It is a collaboration, it is working in teams, it is working with teams from different, you know, specialties. That's, you want a letter of reference from someone that can speak to those things. It, to me, it's not as um, important if I get a letter of recommendation from an organic chemistry teacher that said they got an A in the class. That doesn't tell me a whole lot about you as a person and how you work in teams and how you collaborate and, and um, what, how you're going to be uh, caring for patients. So think about your letter writers. It's really important to, to make those count. So this is the MCAT, um, I'm, and I have, every time everybody looks at this, they think, oh my gosh, 511. Okay, it's the median, so that means 50% lie above and 50% lie below. You want to take it early in case you need to retake it. There's no harm in retaking it. That's okay. People take the MCAT a couple times. 
I'm going to show you this chart. This is from the AAMC. It's using MCAT data. It's validity data. Now, the way to read this chart is the following. This is the total GPA of uh, students that are in medical school. And on this is the MCAT score. Now, this is the percentage and number from 2016 and 2017 of entering students admitted with these scores on the MCAT and their GPA and those who passed step one. So what did I say about the MCAT score, right? The MCAT is a standardized test. It tells me how well you perform on standardized tests. Now, standardized tests are important in medicine because you're gonna have to take USMLE step one, two, three, and when you do your subspecialty, if you decide to go into family medicine, if you decide to be an anesthesiologist, if you decide to be an OBGYN, I had to take written boards for OB, I had to take written boards for anesthesia, and those uh, specialties also require oral board examinations, but like family medicine, internal medicine, those are written exams. No matter what, you're going to have to take a written exam to be board certified. So this just tells me, how do you do on those exams? And it tells me for the MCAT, you know, looking at this number, the score, along with the GPA, what is your chance that you're going to pass step one the first time taking it? Okay, so let's just look here. Um, obviously, anything that's in the blue means that you, oh, oh wow, my thing just went, there we go. Okay, I'm just going to do it this way. Anything in the, in the blue um, shows that you had, you know, 90 to 100% passing rate. Anything in the green was that you had 80 to 89 percent passing rate, and um, the sort of yellow was like the or the orangish color was that those are like 79 percent. Obviously, there was um, if blank there was no observations, or if they had fewer, if there's a dash, it's fewer than 10 observations. So, of course, if you have a 3.8 to 4.0 GPA and you have a low MCAT score or lowish of 490 to 493 you have an 88% chance of passing step one um, when you take it, right? But that's because you have a really high GPA um, to counteract. You clearly have science knowledge to counteract that um, low, low score on the MCAT. Um, if you have a really high GPA and a really high MCAT score, you have greater than 99%. So what this should look at when you're looking at this graph tell you that um, it's still pretty, high chance, you know, if you got a 498 to 501, 87% had 2.80 and 2.99 GPA, 87% or 27 out of 31 observations with this score. But um, when you get the higher MCAT scores, obviously the, the higher chance that you're going to pass that. One of the things to take away is that the higher your GPA, the more that it offsets the, the lower MCAT score or the higher MCAT score and the lower GPA. So for example, look at this, 100% of the people that got a 518 to a 528 with a 3.0 to 3.19 GPA passed step one, right? So each of those things work together to offset the other. Um, so we kind of look at that when we think about um, seeing a lower uh, MCAT score, but with a higher GPA. Um, obviously, when you get down to really low, the numbers were too low. Um, and it's, I think I can safe to say it's going to be a lot more challenging for you to pass it if you have a low GPA and a low MCAT score. And probably I would say you, you're not getting into many medical schools. Um, there's another chart that has it about the student, what the GPA and MCAT was for students who, who got into medical school. This um, AAMC document is, is really quite helpful. But I just give you that because I think that gives you a little bit more granular information than just putting up a median for an MCAT score. So how do we think about um, our uh, applications. We look at experiences of academics, your clinical experience, your service to community, community service uh, work that you do, and your research. And so we, we look all those. We don't expect everybody to have 
you know, transformative experience on every single one of these areas. But we do expect if you're and when you talk about why medicine, if, if you're focused in research and want to be a physician scientist, we're going to expect that you have a lot of research experience and published papers and, you know, worked in labs for a long time. Or if you're saying I am focused on community service and I want to go back and serve my community, we're going to expect that you have, you know, higher level of um, uh, work in that area, but we do expect you to have, you know, not nothing in each of these others, right? So it's kind of a balance of um, what we're seeing on it on an overall application. So once you prepare your application and you click submit, we go through the process of reviewing. We all do every step of the way. Um, several people look at your application. You go through primary review, secondary review, all throughout that we're using the holistic review process. And then we offer um, interviews to a select group of folks. And again, we go through the holistic review through that. So there's different interview styles, traditional interview, one-on-one -on -one with a faculty and um, an applicant. Some have multiple mini interviews, so MMIs. Some have group interviews and virtual interviews have been a thing that most medical schools have been using. Again, virtual can be virtual MMI, can be virtual traditional, virtual group. So there's a lot of different ways that we can do these interviews. Then you go forward to the admissions committee, which again, another large group of people look at your application and um, we implement the holistic review. And that's important. We look at the mission, our mission of our program and to see um, whether the, the applicant fits that mission. And there's a lot of different factors that we, we weigh. Um, we've got a lot of different things that we do in our mission that are important. And, you know, the applicant, it's not only one applicant that we look at, we look at a large group, and you'll see our class is very diverse in a lot of different ways, and have done a lot of different things, because at DGSOM, there's a lot of different areas that we want to focus on and train the next physician leaders. And so after that, we list send out offers, we have a wait list. And then obviously the the rejections, which um, we we always are, are always difficult, but it just means it's an opportunity to regroup. And I always say perseverance and resilience pays off. So that um, once you get um, admissions offer, um, I'll talk a little bit about our scholarships. The um, we have several different scholarships at, at DGSOM, a tuition and fee and living stipend, which is our impact and distinction. We have our LA Care Scholarship, which is a cost of it. Those are cost of attendance scholarships. Leaders of Tomorrow is a tuition and fees and a, a research stipend. And then the DGSOM Scholarship for Excellence, which is tuition and fees, and then the DGSOM Dean's Merit Award. And so that is variable, can be up to tuition and fees, but um, sometimes just covers uh, some portion. So we have a lot of great scholarships that we offer our students um, once they're accepted. And so the here's Geffen Hall. This is where I hang out and um, get to meet up with the students. There's a couple different pathways that you can take in DGSOM and I, we have three tracks um, for this upcoming year. We have the traditional MD track and that's someone who is gonna do four years. Um, and that could be someone who's gonna do community-based uh, work, uh, whether it's community-based research or just community-based um, work in, in, in under-resourced areas. Um, or wants to have uh, an academic medicine career, wants to have teaching career, research, public service, et cetera. That's your sort of traditional MD track. We have our Prime LA track, which stands for Prime Leadership and Advocacy. It's a five-year dual degree program. So you're committing to, you're gonna do your MD and you can do, it's either an MPH, an MBA, uh, an MPP. And your, their focus on is leaders in medicine who have an uh, impact in improving healthcare delivery, research, policy, and underserved communities. So it's a, it's a mission within the mission of the, of the school. It's a very um, popular competitive program. And then we have our MSTP track. Now that's our medical scientist training program. It's to develop physician scientists. It's a combined degree where you get an MD and a PhD. And those are individuals who are really focused in going to be physician scientists. And we have a, a two spots for those that are gonna be doing sociomedical sciences, which is a social science um, focus. 
So those are our tracks. And I'm just going to put here some information about our admissions, um, virtual office hours, um, connecting with the admissions team. And with that, I'm going to give you my wonderful Sunset LA. Not That was um, not what it looked like the last couple of weeks with all that rain, but <laughs> mostly what it looks like. So right now, I'm going to stop sharing. And I would love to open it up. I went through a lot of information, but I just wanted you to have all of that as a sort of starting point. And I'm happy to, to take questions. Jessica? Uh, I think Veronica's doing that part. I will start. Um, one of the questions that came in was, if interested in pursuing an MPH and MD, would that be more than the four years of medical school? Yeah, so that's a great question. So typically um, in um, a traditional medical school without our new curriculum, it would be an additional, you would, you would, um, plan on trying to do it with like a fifth year. Um, but with our discovery year, we do, if you can do it, you can do an MD MPH in uh, the four years. And the reason that we've, we've worked it's through the um, UCLA. So if you wanted to go to, if you were at UCLA and you want to do an MPH, let's say at another institution, then yes, it would be an additional year because you'd have to go out there. We've worked on um, an inter, um, uh, intercalated or concurrent degree program where um, if you, you're doing your MPH at um, the UCLA uh, School of Public Health, you have, it can be done the way it's structured in those four years because we have the discovery here that um, is set up to do that. And you have to apply for the program, but um, I think students have been pretty successful at that. Now, with the Pride program, it is a five-year program, and the reason for that is, you know, you it's it's not um, in that that fifth year. You're it's scheduled so that you can do it a little bit slower, or maybe you want to go outside and do a, at another institution. So, the Prime program was set up so that it had a fifth year, so that you could do more, you know, whether it's you know more work or whatnot within it. Or let's say you you want to slow down, say I want to have a little extra time to study for my step exams. That's that's an opportunity. Um, the Prime program has, it's um, about 18 to 20 students and it's a cohort. Um, it's a really just phenomenal program where you have a lot more um, kind of intersection with the, the cohort because it's, they're, they're tight. They, you do a pre-matriculation program, you get to connect with them and then you have your prime directors and um, they're there, the, the service. It's like a, it's sort of like a, a student affairs within a student affairs. So you get all the things that you have at DGSOM, then you also have that additional with the prime program team. Um, another question that's come up a few times is, uh, is DGSOM more friendly to California residents versus out-of-state applicants? <laughs> that's that's a question um, that always gets asked. You know, the interesting thing is um, it's all perspective, right? So um, if you ask out-of-state uh, folks, they're like, oh, they only take in-state because it's a state school, or they're more friendly to in-state. And then if you ask the um, students at UCLA, they think, well, they only take people not at UCLA. So uh, what I can tell you is we get a lot of applications from across the country. Um, we get a lot of applications from international students. Um, each year, when we look sort of at the way that the offers go out, it's actually a little bit higher um, from out of state than in state. But when we get down to the final matriculation number, so what gets reported in the MSAR, um, folks tend to go where they're from, or you know, they may go come back home. Like let's say they're in the East Coast going to undergrad, they kind of want to come home. Um, they're tired of the snow, or you know, they're ready for the sunny weather. Um, so what we end up seeing um, when it all settles out is that we do see more California residents matriculate. Um, 
there is a benefit on tuition. So the first year you pay a, a slightly higher tuition if you're an out of state, but um, you can establish California residency within that year. So then you're you're paying in-state tuition um, after the on years two through four. So I would say um, the whole entire process of evaluating an applicant, we're not saying, oh, this is an in-state, you get you know, extra points or this is out of state, you don't, we don't do that. We basically look at the applicant essentially blinded by, you know, where they're from. We're looking at what they're doing and what they've done at their institution and, you know, let, let the, the chips fall where they may, so to speak. But I will say at the end, I think, you know, Californians tend to be coming back to California and other out of state maybe decide, well, I don't know, it's kind of far away, or maybe I'm going to stay at, at, at where I'm at. So, you know, we don't know where the other students, we don't find out till much later where the other students that we had been accepted, where they ended up going. So, so I would say, look at the school, at least for DGSOM. If, the, if, if you're an out-of-state um, student and you like what UCLA has to offer, you're excited about coming to Los Angeles, it is an incredibly diverse city, um, then I would apply to it and not think that you're disadvantaged, you're not disadvantaged for being out of state. So some of the people are posting questions about summer programs and all the applications mm -hmm. are closed. Um, the fall we had like probably five or six sessions on summer programs and stuff. And you should start thinking about them towards the end of summer, beginning of fall because most of the applications, some of them closed in January, some of them in March. But um, yeah, we, and we send out a lot of uh, uh, things on the listserv as well. So yeah, if it's an application that's closed for a summer program, um, Dr. Lucero cannot open the application. Yeah, so I would say, I think SHPEP is already closed, but I think PREP is still open till the end of this month. And um, RAP, it won't, you know, that's a reapplication program. So we don't, it doesn't close until much later. So when you start to think about programs, and again, if you miss the window for this year, there's next year to look at the program. Just contact us earlier, get it, get the, get the application program. But I think right now at this moment, SHPEP is closed, but I think PrEP, we're still going till the end of March because I know we're we're doing some outreach to some of our Cal States. Yeah, that application closes on March 30th at 1159. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, one other thing I was gonna mention, and I, I remember I just, we, we put in that stat and I, totally glossed over it at the very beginning. But I know another thing that comes up is that um, if you come from community college or a community college transfer student, that you are less, you have less of a chance of getting in or we don't take, I, I like the, the, the definitives, we don't take. Not true. Um, I'll tell you, if you get, if you have Instagram and look at the DGS on Instagram today, because I was like, this was so... <laughs> It's so timely. Not that I had anything to do with it, but there's a student that they featured um, who actually is a, he is a um, first year med student. Um, he's an MS1 and he went to community college. Um, I think I looked at our stats, um, about 10% of our uh, matriculating class. So again, matriculating, matriculants, 10% of them uh, came from community college. What that means is that, you know, obviously, there's a, except those that are accepted, but the ones that finally decide to matriculate, that's, we looked at those numbers and that's 10%. Um, he was actually on our panel in the fall. Yeah, good. Oh, good, yeah, he was, perfect, okay. Um, and uh, the other thing is um, we have for our first gen, first, so those that are first generation to college, I, I can't remember, let's see, I, I had the, I, I want to get the number correct because that is something obviously near and dear to me because I'm a first generation to college. So I always look at this number. So we had um, 
in 2021, 43% um, matriculants were first generation of college and 2022, 37%. So that is another, um, I think one of the things that our, um, one of our MS1 said is that being at DGSOM as a first generation, she said it's the first time that she's felt um, like she belonged because she didn't have that same feeling even in undergrad. So it's a really important um, thing to, to know. And I'm, I'm very proud of that culture and environment that we, we create. So um, a lot of people are asking for like numbers and ratios and how many people apply, how many people, uh, <laughs> I would say this, and this is a, a data that Dr. Lucero is okay with me sharing. A hundred percent of you that don't apply will not get in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it, so it's so if you guys are looking for the like gaming the the system, um, hundred percent that don't apply, don't get in. Yeah, that is very true. Um, I will tell you, um, I was so worried when I applied um, to medical school because um, like maybe many of you, I was like, well, I went to Cal State Northridge. Um, I was a first generation of college. I knew nobody that was a physician. I didn't know what um, was required. Um, back in the day when there was bookstores, I just went and found this like booklet and was like trying to read through all of like the process. Um, there wasn't a lot of pre-health advising that I really felt, at least I didn't know about or have access. These like pre um, like pre-health programs, I didn't even, you know, no idea that they existed. Um, some of them didn't start even at the time when I was looking, but I I just I went in really like almost blind. Like it was just like opaque. I was trying to get what I could. I would ask anybody. I would ask my organic chemistry teacher. And when I think about it now, it's kind of funny because, you know, he would give an opinion, but it's like he doesn't really know, right? So there's a lot of people with lots of opinions. And I heard this and I heard that. And, you know, I applied everywhere and I applied you know, to, and I looked at that, like, you know, list of like what, you know, and I was, you know, worried, I applied to the, the, you know, programs that were like the top programs and the programs that were, quote, not as top, I said, it didn't matter, I just want to go to med school. I was, um, I had, then I had my list of DO schools, and I never had to, to my, my goal was to apply to the DO schools if I wasn't getting interviews. I, I got into a lot of every medical school that I interviewed um, at, I got in with the exception of Harvard. I interviewed at Harvard and they didn't accept me, but it's their loss. Um, <laughs> then um, there was one school I really, 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 really wanted to go to. And so this is another thing that comes up. I talk to students a lot who you know, they have their dream school, right? Like, and I talked to them because like maybe DGSOM is their dream school. Like, I really want to go, but I got into this school, this school, this school. And I said, you know what? That's okay. Like, we don't always get the dream school, right? For us, what we think is our dream school. And I tell them the story about how I, my dream school was UCSF. I really wanted to go to UCSF for medical school. I was on the wait list for an interview. I didn't even get off the wait list for an interview. And the day that I, I got my acceptance at Yale for med school was the day that I got re like ult finally rejected from UCSF and I cried, I was so upset. And my family was like, well, but you got into Yale. It's like, I don't wanna go there. <laughs> so it was the best experience that I had. It really was because it made me stretch. I got out of my comfort zone. I left California. I went to, you know, completely the other end of the country. And I am so happy that the universe decided to make me go. Cause there wasn't a way, if I would have gotten into UCSF, forget it. I would have like, you know, no, I'm going, you know, and, and I would have missed that opportunity. There was so much experience that I learned. Um, and then I went to UCSF. And then I was on the admissions committee at UCSF. So I always say there's just, 
you know, you can be sad that maybe you didn't get into your dream school, but be happy you got into a medical school. And at the end of the day, I reminded myself that I'm still going to be a doctor wherever I go to medical school. And you always, always, always need to reach for the stars. Apply to like, you know, lots of schools. Don't make it oh, I'm only apply to California schools because I want to go to California. I only want to apply to like New York schools because I'm from New York. Don't do that. You apply broadly. There is, um, I always talk about these zones, right? So there's the comfort zone and then you go a little bit bigger and you're in the stretch zone and then you go a little bit bigger and you're in the panic zone, right? Life is like, you don't want to spend time in the panic zone. You want to spend time. It's nice to be in the comfort zone, right? So I, I like being in the comfort zone, you know, but there, if you spend your time in the comfort zone, then you never grow. You never grow as a person. You never grow in your career. Um, you want to spend time kind of going in the stretch zone and then coming back in the comfort zone and then going in the stretch zone. And so really you want to look at places that is going to be a stretch for you. Definitely stay out of the panic zone. There were some areas in the country that for me would have been the panic zone. I don't want to go there. And so just decide what that is for you. But you do want to be in the, in the, that's the time to be, to stretch. It is the time because then there's going to be other things, you know, and I, I was so thankful that I had that opportunity to really stretch and, and go to the East Coast and be at an institution that I never really thought I would see myself at. And it was a stretch. So please, um, think about that. But I, I agree, like, you will 100% not get into medical school if you don't apply. So dream big, but also have some, you know, good, you know, plan A. As a good anesthesiologist, you have your plan A, your plan B, and your plan C. And that plan C may be reapplying, right? So I had a student, um, you know, they, she didn't get in the first time and she reapplied and everybody's like, well, you know, you're not, she got in, not only did she get into DGSOM, but she got a cost of attendance scholarship too. So it's never assumed that if you didn't get in the first time, that when you reapply, you're not going to get it. Now, what you need to do is think critically about what was my, what were my strengths? Where were the areas I need to improve and really dig in and say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to improve. Okay. So that is, that is really where you need to think about and be thoughtful. Now, the reapplication program helps with that. Um, and I think sort of really kind of honing in sometimes that maybe just you needed to get a little bit higher score on that MCAT. You know, maybe you need to take a couple more science classes. Um, you know, you need to do some more um, clinical work or work and do some more research, whatever that research, you know, that you decide you want to do is. So think about that, but don't you know, your plan C may be reapplying. Our next question is, if clinical research as a clinical research coordinator experience, would that be counted as clinical experience or research experience or even both? Yeah, I get that question a lot. I think, um, so it, it, depends on what you're actually doing in that clinical research coordinator. You, um, I think it more counts as research, but it also, you know, you are interacting with patients and within the, the understanding of their research. Now, why do we care about research? Let's just say, you know, I want to do community health. I want to work in this community. I'm going to, I want to have a clinical practice, you know, working in this you know, underserved community that I belong to, right? So let's say that's my my interest. And you may ask me, why do I need to do research? Well, you there's a lot of different ways that you can do research and this clinical research can be one of it. But the thing is, is that what experience that you wanna gain and that you want to, to explain what you've learned is medicine is about critical thinking. It's about taking in information synthesizing it and coming up with a hypothesis and then testing that hypothesis. So when I see a patient and they've got a, a host of symptoms that they're describing, and then I do a physical exam, and then I think, okay, I've got a couple different things that I'm thinking this could be. 
but I need to come up with a couple tests. I'm going to send you for this test and this test, and then I'm going to get those tests and I'm going to put it all together and I'm going to come up with um, an idea of what I think this is and come up with a treatment plan. You know, research is a way for you to think about, you know, hypothesis testing, what are the tests that you want to do, and how are you developing it? And then the other part about um, research is putting down your information, explaining to the world what you did in a paper. And so the clinical research coordinator, um, oftentimes we look at that as kind of a little bit of both. Um, I think if you're doing research and if you're doing this hypothesis testing more on that side of it, I'm obviously going to think it's more research. And if you have a paper that you're going to be part of, if you're just more interacting with patients, um, doing that that work with the patients and kind of navigating them through the system, I may think it's a little more clinical. Um, each person that reviews your application is going to think about it a little differently, but you want to guide them of what more, what is it? What, what is it about that that you're doing more of? And what is that role? Because I've seen it done in a lot of different ways. So you want to think about it, um, kind of what you are doing. And if there is something that, you know what, I need to show that I I have some critical thinking, you know, hypothesis testing, you know, that sort of more research end of it, then get some experience doing that in addition to, you know, what you may be doing with your clinical research coordinator part if it's much more on the clinical side. We've had a few questions come in about um, the rolling admissions window. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that window, um, so, you kind of saw where I said it's a rolling admission. So we start getting our offers out October 15th, but we still offer um, acceptances and we're going through, you know, the, the, we just offered some more today. Um, so that the window goes long because we have to get through all of the applications. And then um, we start to offer, you know, people that are on the wait list or like high on the wait list and each school does it differently. Um, I believe Harvard and Yale, they just offer everything all on one day and then you're on a wait list or you're rejected. So um, we're getting now into the stage where we're looking more about um, we're getting the wait list set up. And then, you know, as I mentioned, you know, if someone's on the wait list, it's not over until it's over. Right. I've accepted someone who literally they got in on a Friday school started on Monday. So there's, you know, always, always sort of look at it from it's not over till it's over. Yeah, we actually had one of your med students, Ali, who spoke. Mm -hmm. He literally found out four days before and he was <laughs> before he got in. So yeah, yeah, it happens. It happens. Uh, another question is, is it possible for an applicant with a low GPA to be accepted uh, to do GSOM? And what are the main characteristics, characteristics and qualities uh, that you're looking for in an applicant? Um, well, low GPA is very vague. So <laughs> we don't, we look at the whole um, application. And so again, um, when you think about I'm looking at trajectory. You know, I have students that maybe struggled early on and, you know, maybe they're a first generation of college. I remember when I first started, I was, I was like, wow, this is, you know, so different balancing all the different classes, the, the test, this. And so, you know, I, I, it took me a little bit to like catch up. And then by the time I was done, it was like, you know, I was, I was really thriving. So, you know, it's, to me, like if you looked at just my my first year GPA, it might not have been so good. I had family situations that came up. There were, but then if you look at it each year, how I did, and then you looked at my graduate um, education, it's like I figured it out. Like I knew I knew how to to study. Some people already figured out how to study when they're in high school, and so they they hit hit the ground running, right? Some people don't, and so I think. What we're looking at is the whole applicant and seeing what was the environment, what were they, what were the issues that came up, how did they do at the end? If you are kind of all over the place, up and down, up and down, I, I kind of don't know what I can't find a trend there, right? So I need to know that 
it's fast paced. You saw it's like, you know, we do 13 months of preclinical work. You're going fast, right? So we have a lot of support, but you need to know, we need to know that you can study well. So, you know, low GPA, I think it would, I don't know what a low GPA is, right? Like I, I, it, it really, that's nigh the beholder and it depends on the situation, depends on what you were doing. It depends where you're at, where you started, where you ended up. Um, I think those are situations where you want to be, um, you want to really sort of get, you know, have somebody that is um, one of your mentors that have that experience. That's where like the pre-health programs where you can get mentorship can kind of talk to you about that. And it may be that it's that, you know, yeah, you need to go back and do some additional courses to show that you can do the the science that you figured out how to study, that this was just an anomaly. I remember I took a chemistry class. Um, I probably was like a second year and I thought, okay, I'm gonna try my, this medicine. I've always wanted to be a doctor. I'm gonna try this again. It was awful. I mean, I was doing so, and then, and then I thought, okay, I clearly, I can't do this. And it just was that I needed to learn. I needed to have the time and I needed to learn like, how to study for that class. Some things are people's strengths and some people struggle with some classes. So how do you learn how to study when it's a class that's not your favorite class? There were some classes that I just loved and there were some classes that were, were challenging. And so we need to know that you can figure that out and sometimes making taking some extra classes helps us see that now you figured that out. How does UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine view non-traditional students? Every non-traditional student's journey and trajectory may be different is a question that has come through. However, what are the red flags that might alert admission specifically against a non-traditional student? And a third portion of this question is, being an older pre-med in their early 40s, would my age disqualify me from being seriously considered as an applicant? So I always tell a story of um, my um, Dean of, of Student Affairs, um, is now retired, um, but uh, I think she went to medical school. She was like 45. Um, she was one of the best physicians um, that, we had ever seen. Uh, she did work. Um, her patient population was our HIV um, patients. And she was doing it at the time when many people weren't taking care of uh, HIV patients. And she was an advocate. Um, she was a phenomenal mentor and um, was somebody that believed in, in people in ways that I think, you know, the amount of empathy that she she had was was tremendous. You know, what was her story? Well, you know, she had had a family. Her husband was a physician and she took care of the family. I think she did like an MPH or something. And then her kids went off to college and, you know, she sort of asked herself, like, this was something I've always wanted to do. And so you know, she applied and went to medical school. And, and I, so I think about, you know, I was considered a, no, a non-traditional student because I started when I was, I matriculated when I was 27. And I think my lived experience was very different and unique. Um, I think a lot of students now, there isn't, there isn't really a non-traditional, there isn't really a traditional because people do a lot of different things um, in their journey to, to becoming a physician. Because if you remember what I said, um, it's a journey, right? So the moment that you get into medical school, it's not like you're done, you're still on that journey. And I think as we have our careers, we're still on that journey. There's no other career where I think you are constantly learning, constantly exploring. I never have a dull moment. I have, you know, I, I have the best job in the world. I get to do things and, and that I, I think many people never have the opportunity to do. Yesterday, I was taking care of patients on the labor floor, patients who had complex medical issues and that were pregnant, patients who had no complicated and were just delivering their, their child and their first and maybe their second and 
you know, I had that opportunity to take care of them, um, to do C-sections, to place epidurals, um, take away their, their, you know, fried analgesic um, for their labor pain. And today I got to go and accept more students to medical school, right? So I, I think, you know, there's, it is a journey, right? So I would, you know, in anybody, whether you're 40 or whether you're 20 years old, I'm going to want to know why medicine and what have you done and what what is the experience that you have? And as much as I don't think it should be a disadvantage if you're 20 years old going to medical school, I also don't think it should be a disadvantage when you're 40. But I want to know more about your journey and why medicine and what you've done, because sometimes it's the most interesting. We have folks that are veterans that were in combat that have done so many amazing things in their life. And then, you know, this is part of their journey is medical school. So I think it really depends on kind of what, what you've done and why medicine and, you know, kind of what has led you on that path. And so I never say there's a too old or there's a too young because each person is, has a different experience. Um, do you have any medical school interview tips that you could offer us? <laughs> yeah. Um, be yourself, right? So don't try to um, figure out what the questions are going to be, right? So don't uh, don't think, okay, I'm going to have, we will ask you why medicine in some way, right? So obviously have an idea of like, you know, that should be just like, right off the bat, like very casual discussion, you know, people are like, so why medicine, you know, that's something that you need to know, because you would have written about it already, right. So try not to have like a memorized, you know, but have a vision, you know, I always think about, you know, you wrote your personal statement, reread your personal statement, um, you know, have it sort of, okay, look at the schools, so know what the school is about. If you're interviewing, know what the curriculum is, know how that set up. Each curriculum is a little bit different. Think about, you know, when they're going to ask you, you know, why DGSOM? You know, someone may ask you that. You want to be able to know um, why DGSOM and what is it about the area, the environment, the, the community? Um, you know, if you're applying to rural medicine, you know, program, a program that's focused in rural medicine, you know, they're going to ask you, so what have you done? Or if you're from a rural environment, that's obviously going to be like, oh, this is where I grew up. This is where my family's from. Or maybe if it's not that obvious, you know, you can, you can talk about that. So I think it's really um, critical for you to do your homework about the medical schools. The things that you don't want to do is walk in uninformed about the medical school. And not know kind of what what they do, what you're interested in, or be able to articulate your your sort of why medicine or journey. They may ask you a lot of different things. So um, I would say think about that um, and and to, but don't have it memorized. It should be natural. Yeah, and certainly with MMI, you can't game the system. So like you could you know, there is like, I know that there's some websites that post questions, but some of them are, are, are given, but some of them change all the time. So there is, there's not like a system that you could, it's not like a bio exam that you go study the Krebs cycle and be able to spit it out. It's, it has to be, um, and if you're just repeating it, it becomes very robotic. And if you're nervous that, you know. Yeah. The next question that was coming up was about um, the preview and Casper prep and what they are and that they're required at, at your school. Yeah, so we require, um, so a couple things. So for the traditional track, um, preview is required. What I will tell you is um, it's just easy just to take the test. Um, if you're, you know, because what I'm going to say, if you're going to apply to DGSOM, you, you may want to apply to traditional track. You may be interested in prime LA. Um, it's just easier to, to, you know, take the preview. You 
it will be used in at the at the admissions committee level. Um, Prime may not require because they do MMI. Um, it's a situational judgment test, and we require preview, not Casper. So we've had people who have taken Casper but didn't take preview. One of the most important things I will tell you is, regardless of where you're applying, and you're going to want to apply broadly. However, you can organize it. Look at the requirements for the medical schools. Every medical school has a little bit of different requirements. The worst thing you can do is apply to a school and not fulfill one of the requirements. If you don't have three letters of recommendation and you don't get those in and, you know, you've wasted the time and money to apply, we can't move an application forward. Same thing with the preview exam. So the preview exam, um, it is a situational judgment test. There's really not a way to prep for it. it. It's, you just take it. It's not like the MCAT where, you know, you're gonna be doing like, you know, MCAT, you know, prep with like, you know, Princeton or Kaplan or whatever prep class, you know, not, you know, endorsing any one of those per se, but you just wanna take, it's, a, it's a, just a, how you deal with different situations. Um, kind of like, you know, you don't, it's like the, you don't prep for the, or you shouldn't be prepping for the MMI. Um, it's pretty straightforward. There's some sample questions. You can go on the AAMC website. If you get fee assistance, you'll get fee assistance for that preview because it's through the AAMC. Um, but we do require it um, for the, the traditional track. And I would say if you're applying to any of the other tracks, just take it because I would always say you can get into, there are students that have gotten into the traditional track and they got into the prime LA track and they get to decide which one they want to go to. Or there's people that have gotten into traditional track and they're on the wait list for the prime LA. And so they're kind of holding a spot and deciding which, you know, so you really want to think about, you know, don't, don't limit your options just because, you know, the preview exam, it's, it's pretty straightforward. So we do require that if you took Casper, but didn't take preview, it doesn't count. You have to take preview. It would be like saying, I took the GRE. Can I? Will that count for the for the MCAT? No. So. What would you recommend for community college students specifically to do in order to prepare ourselves for the competitive nature of medical school classes to take and opportunities to seek? So I would say whether you're a community college student or whether you're at um, currently now at a four-year university, like the answer would be the same. You know, you, you want to look at um, taking courses that obviously are gonna help with, you know, MCAT prep. So that's just regardless of, you know, whether you apply to DGSOM or whatever, you're gonna, you know, those are gonna, those are gonna be helpful. Um, and learning how to study for those, but that's true of whatever, it's not specific to medical school, it's sort of le learning the information, um, taking that moment to, to understand, as I mentioned, each class is, is different. You know, I, I may feel comfortable and, and like learning about, I love genetics, that was really fun. Chemistry, I enjoyed chemistry, but it was harder for me to study right? Some of us have strengths and weaknesses. I loved organic chemistry. I sat there and was like playing with that, you know, that was, but it wasn't like it came easy to me. I had to study, but I, I liked studying for that better than I liked general chemistry. Each of you are going to say like, I don't like biology as much as I like chemistry, or I really liked physics. You know, there, you know, the, the point of, of college is to dig deep into a subject learn how to gain information, learn how to translate that into, you know, an exam really just shows how much you understand that. And really in, enjoy the idea of learning. And I would also say, do other stuff too, that, you know, classes that I remember I had to take, uh, it was a language class and I, I was, I decided I was going to take Latin. I thought, I don't know if I'm going to like Latin. I, I loved Latin. I didn't know I was going to love Latin. I loved it. I wish I had more time in my schedule because I would have taken another semester of it. I was kind of bummed that I didn't like have that time. I really enjoyed that. And so that was something I learned about myself. Now, 
you know, I had to take a music class that I was not excited about. Um, and, you know, who would have known I didn't like the music class, but I loved Latin. I loved my art history class. I sort of joked I could be like an art history major, except I wouldn't be able to like get a job. But, you know, I, I enjoyed that. And I want to go back and take an art history class again so that I can, you know, learn again, like in that detail of what I learned. So when I walk into, you know, the Getty's free, so I can go to the Getty Museum, I could get more out of it if I took that art history class again, like enjoy that moment of knowledge. Try not to look at it as this is a, is a means to this, right? Once you start doing that, it becomes, you lose sight of the, the opportunity of the education. You have an opportunity to get a higher level education that I thought about it for me, like it's something my my father never had that opportunity. My family never had that opportunity. And so I had to say, like, this is something that I'm doing. Granted, yes, I have to work at the same time. I have to do, but this is something that is an opportunity that I should not just think of it as a means to an end. I should embrace it and enjoy it. So I think really the question should be, you know, what what can I get out of community college? Get all of the knowledge that you can in the cool classes that you get to take and interacting with the professors. I found when I started going to office hours and I like went to all the office hours, especially for the classes that I thought were gonna be more challenging for me, I was way more engaged. I connected, I was able to talk with the professors. So what about this? Oh, I have a question about this. And I really dug into a subject and embraced that in, in a much bigger way than if I just was like, go in, go out, go in, go out. And the professors love to talk about their subject. They love it because they're, you know, that's, that's, what, that's why they went into teaching. So really that's the thing you need to do regardless of whether you're gonna uh, apply to medical school uh, wherever you go to your next, if you, when you transfer in, like you're going to want to, you know, embrace that, learn how to study and going to those office hours does help. And, you know, whether you're taking physics or you're taking Latin or an art history class, like embrace that and, and enjoy it because it is an opportunity that, um, many people don't get that opportunity. And I know that many of you are working and you're making it work because, you want that opportunity. So don't just think of it as like check, like go in and and you're gonna you're gonna embrace it and get the knowledge and and dig in deep and definitely go to office hours. I I got so much more out of the office hours. For clinical experience, do you guys prefer paid experience or volunteer experience? Or does it not matter? I don't think it really matters. I think I understand, you know, we, we, we get it that if some people have to work um, and if they have an opportunity to get clinical experience and they're paid for it, it's not like, oh, well, they got paid for it. It's experience. You know, what you did and what you gleaned from it is really important. Um, I like that when you're part of a team and you do something longitudinally, that's really important. Um, try to get you know, something out of that experience, um, try to do something more longitudinally. For me, personally, I look at sort of that longitudinal experience, how you were part of a team and um, working and collaborating with other groups. I'll give you an example of why, you know, medicine is a team sport. So, you know, when I, um, when I was at UCSF, we developed this um, MAPS team. It was the Multidisciplinary Adherent Placental Service. That MAPS team comprised um, interventional radiology, OB anesthesia, uh, gyne oncology, maternal fetal medicine, laborous, uh, pathology, and radiology, all these different specialties. We came together and discussed the complex cases, these patients that came in that had this terrible disease that if we didn't manage it the right way, they would die. Right. So, um, and, and I didn't even mention, and, and apologies, I'm going to add this, our entire nursing team, which is our OR nursing team, our perinatal nursing team, um, that was an enormous amount of folks that took care of one patient. And in order for us to do it um, in such a way that these patients did well, 
had limited complications and survived, um, we needed all of those team members. And each of them, you know, where we were able to, okay, what about this? And what about, and that was one of the best experiences to be able to collaborate with a team of specialists across all um, these different groups. And those cases, they were long cases. The planning took many, many months. And when we got to do those cases, it was like the best day ever. Like we just had, it was intense, it was good, but like that's a team sport, right? So I, I think building relationships and doing something long-term and having collaborations is really, really important. Um, and so when you do an experience, whether it's paid or volunteer, the longitudinal experience to me is much more meaningful because you're engaged in this relationship building. And that's what medicine is, it's relationship building. Whether it's a relationship with your patient, your patient and the community, the patient and the, 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 the clinic, the providers and other providers and specialists. It's all relationship building. So the, the thing is, uh, I just put a link in the chat. We had like a two hour, two hour and 10 minute talk about clinical experience and all the various ones that are out there. And so go and watch that. One of the things, uh, Dr. Lucero, is it's been coming a lot of like uh, blog posts and things that they're saying that people should go get their nursing degree and then and then take their prereqs and apply to medical school. And that is, um, we've actually had a couple of people that talk about that. That's like a 10 year delay yeah. um, that's happened to a lot of people. So um, if you want to be a doctor, I mean, there's nothing wrong with being a nurse. I work with nurses and they love what they do and they make a very good living. But if you want to be a physician, can, can you just talk a little bit about that? Because there's a lot yeah. of this like information that's going out because of clinical experience, you should become a nurse so that you have clinical experience for medical school, which there's a lot of med students that never went to nursing school. Yeah. Yeah. No, thanks for asking that question. I think actually um, one of the things that you can't game the system, right? So we said like, there's no secret sauce. So um you will be asked why, why did you, that, that question will come up. Why transfer, why you're nursing? Why, why are you doing medicine now? And there's, there are some stories of folks doing that, that said, you know, I was a nurse. I, I took care of, you know, I, I met my husband, whatever, my partner, I, you know, took care of the kids. I was, did nursing. And then my dream was always to go to medical school. And they did that. That's very different than like, I thought this was going to be a better way to like get my clinical experience. It's not, it's not. The other thing is the doing a, a master's degree in something because you think it's going to make you look better because maybe your grades weren't as good. Or, don't do a degree to um, get to look better for an application, right? It goes back to what I said about the journey. I, I went on a journey and got my master's because I had I had given up my my dream of going to medical school and and my other thing I wanted to do and I was good at was um, my social psychology work. It was re I loved it. I found it fascinating. My dreams. I'm going to be a PhD, but in the back of my mind there was always this, you know. I didn't do medicine because I didn't think I was good enough to do medicine. I didn't do medicine because I didn't think I was smart enough. I didn't do medicine because I was told I wasn't good at math and you can't go to medical school. Like I was being told not to do it because of all of these like preconceived ideas about, you know, how smart I was, whether I was good at math. And so I found something that I could do that I enjoyed, but it never really fulfilled my my passion, my, my, you know, what I wanted to do since I was a kid. Now it would have been different if I was like, yeah, I wanted to do that, but now I'm really into this and I totally want to keep it. It wasn't, no matter what happened, I always had this like lump where I was like, I really want to do this. Like my life would never be fulfilled if it, and I, and I was being told that I couldn't do it, right. That it wasn't that I, that I decided not to do it after giving it consideration. I was told that I couldn't do it. That's very different than someone saying, okay, I'm going to do this master's degree because I think that's going to give me an edge so that I can go get, that's not the reason to do it. I love doing my master's. I did, I thrived. I was, I enjoyed it. And I got into a PhD program. It was in that moment where somebody came to me and said, one of my colleagues 
who went on to do his PhD said, you're smart enough to do it. If you always wanted to be a doctor, then you should be a doctor. Go. And I'm like, but I, I'm too old. I was only 23 at the time. I'm like, too old. I have to do all this pre-med classes. He's like, that's what you want to do. You should do it. Right. So I embarked on that journey and that was my story. I didn't try to game the system to think, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm do Don't ever do a degree because you think it's going to help you get to another degree. So what's, or get, get into medical school. That's not, that's, that's not, the reason to do something. And you absolutely should not go into nursing because you think it's going to help you get into medical school, because that's not fair to your patients. It's not fair to your nursing colleagues. It's not fair to you because you're never going to have that same fire and passion about nursing if you're just saying, I'm just doing this to get to this next thing. And what, guess what? You may not get into medical school then. And then you're going to be bitter about that. So I would absolutely discourage anybody from doing, whether it's nursing, a master's degree, something, you decide to do something because you've made the decision that this is, this is a journey that, that this is where you've taken your journey and you want to do that. I have had folks decide, you know what, I don't want to go through the expense, the time that it's going to take to, to go to undergraduate medical school, graduate medical education. I actually am going to be happy being a nurse practitioner or I'll be happy being a, a physician assistant. That's different. That's different. That's you making the decision that for various other reasons, you know, you want to do other things and medicine, you know, that journey is going to be so long and it's all encompassing and you have other things that you're interested in. That's okay. The one thing about nursing that I think is really a very positive thing is that, you know, they work 36 hours, they do their shift and then they're done. And so they can do other things and that's okay. And if that's what they, if that's what you want to do, then you absolutely should pursue that. And I have a lot of friends that are nurses and they have a great life. They're 36 hours on, they go and do other things. They travel, we have traveling nurses. They, you know, they, they have other like hobbies. They, I, I love horses. Like if I could ride, I would love to have a horse, but like my job is all encompassing. I could never have a horse. They could have a horse, right? So you do the things that, that you do because you think about your whole self. Not, I would never say go be a nurse because that's going to get you an opportunity to go to medical school because there we're going to wonder why did they do nursing and why now medicine? You, you can't like our, our committees are savvy enough to, to pull that out. And then we're like, this doesn't make sense. I don't understand why medicine, why did they do nursing? And, and then, you know, you, you don't get into medical school and, and you're kind of now bitter. So we, we don't need that. Yeah. And Dr. Lucero showed the picture of the Geffen building. There's a thing on there. It's, called, it's a radar. It's called the BS radar and they're pretty good at picking it up. <laughs> they look at 8,000 applications a year, so they get very good at this. And yeah. so, um, Again, this is always people always ask about how to game the system or the secret sauce and all that stuff. And, and there isn't like, I think, you know, it's kind of like, uh, it's, it's pretty much every dean is keeps saying this and we get the same question. So we, yeah. um, this is a question, some couple of questions about undocumented students, mm -hmm. um, yeah. at UCLA. And, um, I know that I know actually three of them currently, mm -hmm. so. We have, um, so we definitely um, really want to have um, all students apply, even if you're undocumented. We have a student organization called Undocumed, um, and we do, we have um, several uh, DACA students each year, and there is, um, it's a commitment of the institution to help support them. There's a couple different versions. You can have AB 540, which is you're in California and you come from a, um, have gone to California high school and you get uh, designated as AB 540 and that makes you eligible for all of the state aid. And then we have students that are from out of state that are um, DACA and we um, work really hard and have um, resources to support them. So yeah, we do, we do like to, um, that should not stop you. Another question that, that came up was about the MCAT and what role does it play if you're disadvantaged, if you have to take it twice, and what is the lowest cutoff? 
<laughs> we always say there's there's no cutoffs because we look at various factors. It's a holistic review, right? So we have to look at all the different factors in an applicant. And whether you're disadvantaged, you have to take it twice, whether you're like working, whether you're, you know, all of the different things that we look at. Um, I will say you, you know, there are for prep courses, they often offer um discounted um courses for for the um like if you're doing like a Kaplan or um, Princeton or whatever. Um, I just, I mean, not that I'm endorsing one, one particular program. I'll just tell you personally, I, I called up, um, you know, heard about that you can get, um, you know, some fee assistance or discount scholarships or whatever. And so I called the Kaplan, I asked them, it wasn't widely publicized because I, I didn't have any money. And I was like, okay, they said, yeah, here, you have to show your tax documents, all this stuff. So I qualified for a, a very significantly reduced, um, cost for the course. So I would always look at those options. Um, I actually think if you're not a fabulous standardized test taker, like, and I mean, like, you're not one of these people that could take any standardized tests and get 99%, whether you took the course, there are people like that, like, that's not me, that is not me. Um, I um, encourage folks to do some sort of prep course. I also will tell you, there is um, one of our RAP students that I told, I asked her, she increased her score pretty significantly. And I said, can you please tell me what you did because students will wanna know. And she said, I basically blocked out time, worked it out in my schedule with work and saved up so that I could not work for a month. And that's all I did with study. And honestly, that's what I did too. I worked it out so that I could just focus on that. And that is one of the things that was golden. It like how it helped her, it helped me. Like it was, it was the way to go. So what however you can structure it so that you're not, if you're gonna work eight hours and then come home and say, well, I'll study when I get you won't. You're just not in that mindset. Our minds work differently. We actually are better in the morning, like taking it information. I have to do my um continuing medical education, my MOCA for my recertification. I don't do my MOCA test questions. We call them MOCA minutes in anesthesia. I don't do my MOCA minutes except in the morning because that's when I'm like fresh and I'm like ready to go after I have my espresso. Um, so I, I make sure that I have, um, you know, there's times when it's good to study. And when you're tired and you're exhausted, it's like how many of you have said, yeah, I'm not going to work out today. I'll go after work and you don't go to the gym or you don't like go on your run. I always do that. If I don't run in the morning, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to after like a long day, like, you know, while it's dark out now, I was going to say, I'm certainly not going to get out and go run right now. Right. Like even if it was light out, I, you, you have to like schedule that time. And, um, we do take into consideration all of the different factors. Um, but look at that, you know, that, that scale that I showed you, you know, it's going to be harder to argue if you have a much lower MCAT score and your GPA is lower that you're, you're not going to be able to, we just want to know you're going to be able to take that standardized test. Your step, your step scores are going to be passing. That's what the MCAT tells you. And really, you know, if it's not the 99th percentile, fine, it doesn't have to be the 99th percentile you want to know something about yourself too. How do you do on those standardized tests? Are you going to need some extra prep time when you're thinking about studying? I knew I needed extra studying time. And so I, I, I started my um, rotation. I, I was off by uh, one rotation so I could take extra time to study in med school because I was worried. I'm like, I'm, I got to do well on this. And and I took that time. I studied. That's all I did. I focused on studying for my U S assemblies and I passed, I passed all of them. So, so that's really what you have to do. Oh, sorry. Go no, ahead. no, no, God, no, no, God, no. Sorry, I did. I, I was just gonna say, I, I think what, what you need to do is be realistic about the time that you set up and schedule things in there, and know what your strengths are, know the things that you need to work on. That's it's always comes down to that. So, okay. Um, I don't want to embarrass this one, but Trinity um, studied on the MCAT on her own and in a couple of weeks she's doing a presentation and she got a 520 and she's a D1 basketball player. So um, oh. so she's going to tell you all her secret sauce of what yes. she did to do well on the MCAT. And I'm embarrassing her. So, but I, <laughs> I like to brag. Um, but uh, can you, so this is, we're still getting a lot of these questions about research. And I think the um, can you explain this as you as a practicing double board certified? 
how do you learn right now about your practice is, is the like the, through research and so can you just talk uh, I yeah. work in the ER so I, I kind of so if you just explain it to that way that that's how you yeah no I I think um so when I'm dealing with a um complex case so you know I had we have uh, congenital cardiac patients, so patients that have um, complex cardiac disease, you know, Schoen's complex, for example, it's very rare, right? So if I'm taking care of a patient and I have to provide anesthesia to that patient and they're, they're going to deliver in their obstetric patient, I need to understand, you know, I'm going to go back and look at the, the data and say, okay, what has been done? What is the literature? I have to be able to sift through various papers. I have to be able to understand, you know, what the conclusions that they gained, but what, how was the, how was it done? How was the research done? Was there any confounders? Was there any, what was the hypothesis they're testing? If I'm going to make a decision on a ma management plan for them, you know, what's, what is the work that's been done before? Is it observational? Did they do randomized clinical trials? You know, all of those things are really important. And I, I think the more research experience that you have, you're able to unpack that and unpack it quickly, right? So, you know, we will get things where patients will come in quickly and we have to make decisions. And, you know, so I need to, to assess, especially if it's something rare. But I also think, you know, if I want to try to understand if we're going to have a change in management, right? So one of the big things that came out is sort of like, when we talk about platelet counts for epidurals. If there's a too low of a platelet count, you know, what do I, what, where, where is too low? Where am I going to do, not do harm, but also be able to provide analgesic? So as, as data gets done and we have big data that comes out, we have to look at it. We have to analyze it. If I'm going to do a different management, you know, there's been a new management or where do you try uh, transoxemic acid, you know, let me look at the data that was done, what papers are out there, what particular clinical scenarios. I'm constantly reviewing that and critically reviewing it. The more research that you do, the more experience you have in research, the better it is for you to like really synthesize that and unpack it. Now, my master's was in general experimental psychology, right? So I did a whole thing on research methodology. So I was already attuned to like analyzing that data quickly and understanding what was the methods, well, how did they set up this? You know, that set me apart because I had that experience that I could like create a, a, a study with sound methodology without confounds. I could do all the statistical analyses. You have to think about that, you know, now you don't have to get a master's to do that, but doing, being in a research and having that research experience, again, you develop a hypothesis, you're thinking critically about something, you strategize, you have an idea of what you need to do and, and that helps you become a better clinician when, you know, something changes, right? When there's a, a new paper that comes out or, you know, should I be, what about, you know, uh, the, the COVID? We looked at COVID, like what about COVID vaccine trials? What are we looking about? Like, what if I get COVID? Should I be taking the Paxlovid? Like, should I, what's, what's the data on that? We're always going to be assessing that. We need to look at that information and your research experience that you have. Again, that's part of your journey. You're doing that. It's, you should not be just saying, I'm doing research because check, got to do that. I'm doing this clinical work, check, because I got to do that. You're doing this research because you're going to say this experience and the skills that I'm learning is going to help me be a better doctor. That's why we want to see it. We don't want to see it because we're like, we're going to make it really hard for you to come to medical school. We want to know that you have this, that you started on this, that you gained this information. It's a journey. So I want to know that you have that experience, that you've taken the time to, to look at this because you're going to be that much of a better doctor with that experience. Um, this, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, there's some people asking about scholarships, specifically merit scholarships, and on what, how is it decided on who gets it? Do you look at GPA, MCAT, or what other metrics? So each um, institution has uh, their own way of looking at scholarships. And, um, you know, if it's a particular donor that's given it, they have certain criteria. So I can't really speak for 
broadly for scholarship, all scholarships, and each of our scholarships also have their based on what the donor wants or what were, you know, what, who gave the money and what, if they had any restrictions or whatnot. But generally, I would say, you know, we call all of our scholarships merit scholarships because getting into medical school, as you know, is, is hard and it's competitive and you all are, um, you know, merit that you, you all have done something, accomplished something. I think people get stuck in this idea of merit means metric of, um, you know, GPA, MCAT, like that's not, we do holistic review. So we also do holistic merit. We do a holistic review for the scholarships too. You know, that is, that, that's not, um, you can't say, I got 99th percentile and so I'm for sure going to get a merit scholarship. I mean, maybe some are like that, but we don't look at it just like that. There's, there's a whole package that we have to look at of the applicant. Obviously, you know, if there's a particular donor request or something that, you know, we look at a particular, you'll see like some of, I, I was looking at these like UC undergrad scholarships. Some are like someone has to be from, you know, a particular high school, right? Like that's sort of how, you know, and maybe some merit scholarships, they're called merit scholarships, but they, but they may be because, you know, they're a particular, they have to be part of a particular area, a particular group, community or whatnot. Um, but generally I, our merit scholarships, we do a holistic merit review. We're looking at everything about the, about the student. Our next question is, since David Giffen School of Medicine screens before sending out secondaries, can you provide some insight on what factors and qualities um, that are looked at in determining whether or not an applicant is invited to submit a secondary? Again, it uh, goes down to the holistic, you know, there's, we're looking at the whole package of the, the applicant for the primary. So like primaries are looked at, the secondaries, like all of it is again, holistic review with, with mission driven. Um, I think most uh, places are, you know, not everybody gets a secondary. So I think that's probably true of most medical schools. It's, you don't always, not everyone is getting a secondary. So I think what um, generally speaking, most medical school, I don't think I've, I haven't seen any medical school that says we don't do holistic review. And so what that means is they're looking at, um, again, their mission, right? So if someone is applying to a medical school that's focuses on rural medicine, probably not gonna get a secondary if you have nothing in your application or you know, don't come from a rural environment or don't indicate something about why rural medicine, right? So like that's, there's, there's a lot of different factors that go into it, but it's really holistic. And we're gonna look at, you gotta look at the mission of the medical school and then we, you know, from there, everything, whether you're getting the secondary or the secondary leads to an interview or the interview leads to an admission to the medical school, every step of the way we're doing a holistic review. Some questions, some very yeah, important I can, this, this is, oh. yeah, I think this is something you said previously, but um, I think it was you, but uh, people talk about they want to do something like, I want to do cancer research, and they're applying, but they've never done any kind yeah. of research in cancer, yeah. or I want to help the underserved, but like, you've lived like two exits from, you know, Skid Row, and you've never gone there to do any kind of homeless outreach or anything like that. So, uh, mm -hmm. and that goes back to the whole, like, you know, you guys are pretty smart and can pick those things <laughs> yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. No, that is true. Thank you for, for, to, I, I, I did mention this. I always say like, one of the things that, you know, folks will say is like, oh, I, um, I really want to work with the underserved. And then you're like, okay, so tell me more about that. They're like, I don't know. I haven't figured out who I want, you know, don't, you can't game that system. I, I want to know that you've done that that work and you understand that. Um, obviously, if someone's had a lived experience, they can talk about about that. But I would expect that they're that they've you know done work in that. That they've again, it it's you started that journey for why medicine. If your why medicine is to work with a marginally housed community 
then I expect that you have done something volunteered work relate, you know, paid, you know, work, research something in that community. If you haven't, then you're just telling me something you think I want to hear and I'm not going to buy it. And I say, well, why have you have not done it? Right. So I think that's a really, um, I think it's really important that you got to be true to yourself and, and your, and your why medicine. Um, I, I think it's, you know, we don't, we, we definitely have needs and we need to, you know, help the diverse community. There's a lot of health disparities out there. So obviously that's really important. But if you're telling me you're going to, you care about health disparities, but you haven't done any work in that, then I know that's not true. That's not, that's like, you know, you need to, and, and that's why it's important for you to do it longitudinally. Doing it for a month or two is not enough, right? I got to see that you have that commitment. And that's really because I'm, I'm going to, you know, you're going to come in and and the idea is that again you started this journey and you're going to continue and you're going to be in the discovery you're doing something that's continuing with that so i i think it's important for you to be honest with yourself about why medicine and be honest about um the 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 work that you want to do and what you're passionate about you, you got to being passionate about that means you're going to love what you do and this is a long arduous process and it's worth it. I mean, I can tell you for me, it was absolutely worth it. I love what I do. But if I was doing it because my parents said being a doctor is prestigious, or I thought I was going to make a lot of money and, you know, oh, at least I have a job, like that's not the reason to do it. Um, the reason to do it is because you have something, a vision of what you want to do. And, and, I still think medicine is one of those fields that there is an enormous amount of altruism that goes into it. I gave up a lot of my personal life to do the work that I do because it was so important to me because it wasn't because I thought it, I didn't think I was giving up anything, right? But if somebody else may look at it and say, oh, well, you don't have your nights and weekends, you're on call, you're, the, but I love what I do, right? So I think you, you have to say up front, like, that's the commitment I'm making and it's important. And if I don't want to, there's so many other things that you could do. There's, you know, you all are bright and smart. And so there's so many other things you do. You're here on a Friday night at what time is it? Uh, 6.48 PM. And you're learning about the things ap applying to medical school. It means that you care and you're passionate about this. So find what that passion is and, and do it and start that journey. Now it's there. Do, do the things that you're you're interested in and find the ways to to be able to get involved regardless of what it is you know regardless of yeah okay you can't you're not going to be the surgeon right now but you can be doing some work that's going to be helping you know whatever patient or community that you're interested in working with we've had a few um, series of questions that have come up about learning disabilities and accommodations, um, support services, and kind of piggy, piggy back on that, um, someone asked, how does UCLA view issues such as mental health and mental illness within the context, context of the applicant? Yeah, those are great questions. So I look at the work that I do um, in JEDI, um, obviously justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, learning disabilities, learning differences, um, that falls to me under those, um, any sort of chronic illness um, that falls under um, diversity and inclusion. Because I think uh, when you think about seeing the world differently and looking at um, how you solve a problem, when you have some of these different learning differences, you think about the world differently. It doesn't mean that you know, people may need accommodations. They may need to have extra time if they have dyslexia or they may need extra time. They may need to take, they have ADHD or something where it's like there's there's different ways that they have to learn or take in information, whether they're auditory learners, visual learners. Um, so we value that. Um, we also make sure that we have, so we're one of the few schools. This is like one of the, the things I like to brag about. We have um, a director of disabilities that is 
dedicated to DGSO. It's like hired through the medical school. So I have access and I work with, and, and we actually have, um, Grace Clifford is the person that's the director. She gives it, gave a talk and, and, and is involved in um, educating our admissions team on, you know, disability and how we think about chronic illness and disability work. And so that's really important because I think that you see a lot of um, the way people think and of thinking differently is how we make, how we innovate, how we make discoveries. And I sometimes think we don't value that enough in like the traditional like undergrad and college. Um, we've sort of make people fall into this, you know, bell-shaped curve and there's people that are on the outside of it. And, and I, and I, I want to see them, you know, medicine is one of those things that you can find your, your path and your niche. You know, there's pathologists and surgeons and radiologists and OBGYNs and, you know, uh, primary care. And you all do a little bit of different things. I mean, you're all taking care of patients and you're learning, you have to learn the sort of basic stuff. But then, you know, once you get into graduate medical education, you start to like, you know, dig into different areas, radiation oncology. I mean, there's so many different that I think um, plays to strengths that people may have. And sometimes folks that learn differently have those strengths in, in some areas. And we have to be able to support that. Now with mental health, I think it's a really important, we have the Behavioral Wellness Center. And so I think um, folks that, um, you know, have any sort of mental health um, struggles that they've had, I think, you know, it's a delicate thing to sort of describe. And I, I think it really depends on kind of where you're at with it and, you know, how you've managed it and, and how it works and, and really each an individual personal thing about disclosure. Um, but we care about mental wellness and well-being and have, and students have access to it and, you know, experts and, and, you know, we, they have therapists and, all of the resources that they'll need, um, that's not something, I, I think it's no different than, you know, if I'm a diabetic and I need insulin, I'm not gonna, you know, be judged negatively. Um, if I have, if I suffer from a de depression, I, I take medication or, you know, I, I have, you know, any other mental health issues. It's private. I don't think I need to disclose it. Um, that's under, that's, that's the, the, as long as I'm getting, you know, cared for, right? So in the same way that if I'm diabetic, I don't need to say like, I'm diabetic, unless there was some reason in my, in my story of like how that came to be and why medicine for me, and I feel comfortable disclosing that. But I also need to make sure that, you know, I I'm treating my diabetes. So I don't have an incident where I'm taking care of a patient and I'm not well treated, right? It's like the same thing. Um, so I, I think mental health, um, normalization of any mental health issues needs to happen. Um, but I do think, you know, I, I would never tell someone, oh, you should disclose that because that's going to help or don't disclose that because that's, that's going to hurt you. I would say it's, it's an individual decision, um, just as much as someone may not disclose that they have diabetes because it's well controlled or they have an insulin pump or whatever, right? So um, we had, I had a nurse that I worked with who, you know, for years, I had no idea she had an insulin pump. She was so good at taking care of, she did diabetes care for the, for our pregnant patients. And then I realized like, as we got closer and chatted, I was like, oh, that's why, like, that's her passion, right? So she has it because she has a lived experience and there's nobody better than her to take care of a patient that has any type of gestational diabetes, type one, you know, type two diabetes, she's like the person, right? And she's passionate about it and she understands it. And, you know, that's that's her lived experience. And I think she, she be, she's an amazing nurse for that. Um, but I would never expect her to like tell that to everybody. That's sort of as it comes, like when, you know, she feels comfortable disclosing that. Well, um... It's almost seven o'clock and oh, yes. time flies. <laughs> time flies when you're having fun. And yeah. I know.